but uh, Artem Fua in from Silicon Valley. He's going to be here on Thursday's well for that sixth part, but he's going to talk about autonomous agents. So please enjoy. Yep. Hi, everyone. So I'm just going to quickly jump into it right away. Imagine you want to research a topic of the future of AI. You want to understand what's going to happen soon in terms of AI space and so on. And you don't want to see it on, on a one hour and 30 minutes lecture. Um, you don't want to click on the thousands of links. You don't want to research uh, and spend a long time doing that. You want to have a concise report right away, right there. This is possible now with autonomous AI agents. It's also possible now to basically send a prompt to ChatGPT and get your favorite pizza delivered from the favorite restaurant. Um, furthermore, it is possible now to execute on any, almost any, online task. Like, say, for instance, doing um, a California driving test online, and you can look at the sinister face of this guy. You can trust he did it himself. So, yeah, uh, my name is Art. I'm uh, or, originally, I'm a software engineer. I was born and raised in Ukraine. I have been developing AI products for the past more than a decade, I guess. As every second Ukrainian software engineer right now because of the geopolitical situation, I'm also an ethical hacker and uh, work a lot in cybersecurity space. Um, and I'm a serial entrepreneur. I came to MIT to do my MBA degree, but too many people ask me why a software engineer does an MBA degree and I dropped out. Well, not exactly because of that. <laughs> I started my own company, which is called Kraken AGI, and we are building agents with the mission to drastically elevate global digital reliability and security. We're basically building autonomous AI agents for cybersecurity and software development space. Now, today, I want to quickly touch on the topic of um, terminology in this field. It's extremely, confusion, uh, it's extremely confusing and convoluted, unfortunately, right now, as in any new field. I also want to explore autonomous AI agents from the perspective of specifically AGI, artificial general intelligence. And I want to expose you to some um, techniques and mechanics that are being used in the industry to build, to build such an agents right now so that you maybe can go offline and research more on these topics. In terms of terminology, GPT is a model. GPT-1, GPT-2, GPT-3, GPT-4. ChatGPT is a SaaS product. GPTs are now agents or copilots or assistants. So the, the terminology in the industry is extremely, extremely confusing. Different things mean the same, um, although named differently. Different th things that are named the same mean different stuff. So it's, it's like super confusing right now. And this is fine. You need to understand that this is fine. When you search something on the topic of autonomous AI agents, you will see, well, in some paper, neurosymbolic linking. In another, retrieval augmented generation. Google will tell you this is called grounding. Some other folks would use emotional grounding concepts. So this is fine. But let's touch on a couple of key terms here. So the agents have been developing for quite some time. Um, since the advent of AI, basically, in during this old um, AI deep learning um, hype, um, this architecture emerged. So it, it it was quite some time ago, and basically the main components of it is we have a system that can autonomously perform. It has sensors. It ca it has actuators. It interacts with an environment. Post generative AI hype, so like a couple of years ago we got a more simplified architecture and a more simplified approach. Now, actuators and sensors are kind of called tools. Now, in the system, we have either an LLM as a core or a family of AI models, basically um, providing reasoning capability for the whole agent itself. We give out a task to an agent um, that it needs to achieve on a goal. Another thing I want to define here today as well is what is AGI, what is artificial general intelligence. And I think um, Google has taken an approach to that and, and actually had very good definition. AGI is basically something that can accomplish any task that human can accomplish or can do or kind of can interact and react in any environment human can interact and react. Now, what's today's AI is missing? To, to, to be AGI, well, except of this lame joke about letter G. Um, today's AI is like a monk 
in a cave, meditating. So it, it like the LLM or ChatGPT when you interact with it, it's a snapshot of time and space and knowledge. It's very wise. It has a lot of general knowledge, but it exists outside of time, outside of the environment. And basically, you come up to ChatGPT, you bring a letter with the task written on it. ChatGPT gets this letter, reads it as a monk, writes down the result, gives you back, and keeps meditating. It also has quite a lot of constraints, specific scalability constraints. One of the scalability constraints is the fact that, well, if you bring like a bunch of books to this monk, um, it will just truncate half of the information that has been provided and will only work with information that allows, that its context window allows. Another thing to look on the current AI to kind of put in an, an additional analogy is what Ricard mentioned on today's lecture about the foundation mo models, that the um, current LLMs foundation models are components of the brain, but not the whole brain. Our whole brains are much more complicated. It's a family of AI intertwined together, and they're not the whole body. The body has the sensors, interfaces to act, to feel, to see, to have vision, and so on. Uh, current LLM models only have limited interfaces to do that. Now, still, considering this, can we achieve AGI-like capabilities today? And the answer is, we kind of can, or we at least can push to AGI-like capabilities. And there are a couple of approaches to that. One of the approach is what Jan Likun, he's a chief scientist at Meta, proposes. It's basically, uh, he basically says, hey, LLMs are dumb. They can't execute on a bunch of tasks, like say planning, they still hallucinate. So we need to build a completely new architecture, basically inherit our own knowledge and build a completely new approach, completely new AI model, probably based on transformers or something else and um, I'll give the new AI, new architecture of this new ability. But I'm a software engineer, I like, love to problem solve, and in software engineering industry we say composability over inheritance. So uh, we potentially still can try and use something that's already exists in the field and try to apply, try to work around limitation that exists there, try to uh, create new techniques around it, and actually still try to push a, um, the existing LLMs towards AGI-like capabilities only using what we have. And that's another approach that currently the industry and most of the Silicon Valley startups and companies are, are taking right now. How to do that specifically? How can, we build, how can we push current LLMs, those monks sitting in the caves, to be more like AGI? First, we can give, it, we can give the LLMs um, ability to self-reflect. We as humans, humans, we are thinking iteratively. We don't have, like when we produce an idea, our next thought is being fed off the thought that happened a second ago. So we iteratively think about something until we come up with the result. We don't just go ahead right away and produce the idea or, or suggestion or something. This technique of like thinking associatively in iterations is called the chain of thought. And it's been applied in prompt engineering you can apply it on your own even now when you go to ChatGPT and ask it to think about some concept um, in a couple of iterations based on your uh, new iteration on the result of the previous one. You basically will be implementing a chain of thought technique. And it is extremely powerful, so much powerful that Google actually decided to use it for their marketing purposes when they released Gemini Ultra, which is a new model by them. They basically claim that their model is much more powerful than GPT-4, but it actually is much more powerful than GPT-4 on the chain of thought at 32 iterations. So again, it can drastically increase the performance of the model through simple prompting technique. Another technique is critique prompt. It's basically you sit, um, look uh, at yourself in the mirror after your well, maybe successful, maybe a failed date, and you like thinking of what you did wrong or what you did right. So basically, you can implement the same approach or in the prompt for the current LLMs and foundation models. Now, if we, so also as humans, we not only like self-reflect and think iteratively in time, 
we also continuously learn from our experiences. We continuously kind of adjust our weights and biases in our brain. It's not that we are a snapshot that we are static and only trained on some particular knowledge. No, we continuously improve ourselves. This improvement can be achieved with a strategy that is called reinforcement learning with human feedback. When you open up ChatGPT, you see like, dislike. That's basically OpenAI getting data about how well ChatGPT produced the result. And basically, at some point in time, they will fine tune the model that they have on this likes and dislikes, producing a better, more uh, performant, fine tuned model. But now, AI itself is very smart. And can we ask AI to do this like and dislike? Can we ask AI to remember to do this critique prompt? If we ask AI to do this critique prompt, this technique will be called uh, reinforcement learning with AI feedback. It's quite a recent one, and but it already is extensively used in the industry. For me, this com concept of RLIF is like sleep, like a concept of sleep for humans. When we sleep, we adjust our weights and biases again, we remember new information, we learn new things that we, uh, we kind of like engrave the things that we learned during the day. Now, still it might not give a capability for the current LLM to produce information and produce uh, value um, working with the tasks related to recent events. But can we just give this monk that's sitting in a cave and, and a computer and access to a news source? Or can we give them a vocabulary or some kind of a book so that a computer, an LLM, I'm sorry, an LLM can search um, this news source to get the most relevant information for the task that is also the most recent from maybe today, from maybe a couple of seconds ago even. Or even, can we give them um, a notepad to remember things that happened recently, to write down, jot down some notes in terms of the tasks that have been um, asked just a couple of prompts before. And for that, we in the industry currently use so-called retrieval augmented generation. Google also calls it grounding, uh, uh, this approach grounding, but most of the people call it rug. Um, again, coming back to the terminology aspect. So this is extremely high field right now. Retrieval augmented generation is extremely, extremely um, active. Um, I mean, myself, I work up in, uh, wake up in the morning. Um, we have an internal tool developed in the company that basically uh, funnels all the news sources um, around the um, AI topic that is relevant to us all the academic papers and things like that, it basically filters out only the relevant items and gives it, back, it gives it to the team to read. And every week I read something new on retrieval augmented generation. Every week a new technique is coming up, every week a new approach is there. So it's very active field and actually it produces quite, quite valuable results. For those of you who, who are kind of familiar with software engineering, but they want to play around with something, check out Llama Index Framework. Um, they are doing an extremely amazing job of uh, gathering these techniques and implementing them as they are published in academic papers. Now, I want to do a quick giveaway. Um, if you um, solve the next task on the next slide in five seconds. And um, if, you, if you can do that, I'll just buy two burgers back home when I'm in California. Um, if you can do that, um, you will buy three considering the prices for burgers here in Boston. Um, but anyway, um, basically on the next slide, I will give you a task. You have five seconds to solve it. Ready? Five, four, three, two, one. You lost. Okay, two burgers for me when I'm in California. Why are we so bad at symbolic calculations? For calculator, it's just, it's just a microsecond to solve the task. For calculator, it, it, it's extremely computationally efficient for this. We are extremely inefficient for symbolic stuff, for working with structured data. Our brains are not wired for that. Same problem with LLMs, unfortunately. The LLM architecture is not wired to work with symbolic calculations, structured tools, and, and so on. But RAG, the retrieval augmented generation that I mentioned before, also gives a capability for LLMs 
to work with these tools and synergize with these tools. LLMs now can use calculators, they can use some interfaces to act and interact in the environment, and they can basically um, be much more efficient for the task where structured and symbolic computation needs to, be ha to happen. Now, if we teach LLM to self-reflect, we do continuous learning, we um, give access for LLM to tools, to structured knowledge, to new sources, and so on. The only thing that's left for us to do is just to teach it how to plan. Um, planning is a separate, quite large subject, thousands of papers there. If you want to play around with planning techniques, similar to what I mentioned about Lama Index, check out Langchain. There are just actually a couple of frameworks for planning. Um, at our company, we build our own framework, but Langchain will get you started with just basic stuff that you can check out. Um, Baby AGI, LLM Planner, and, and a thousand of other papers basically proposes different approaches and planning techniques. But LLMs in, its, in itself, they're still very bad planners. And that's what I was showing on this Jan Lee Kuhn's uh, Twitter post. They, it, it has been shown in, in research and in papers that the planning capability of LLMs are, are quite limited. Um, here on, you can see on the screenshot of this chat GPT, that's not my screenshot, you can check out the Twitter post lately, but basically it, it fails to plan for a simple instructions, for a simple task. Is it, is it critical though? Is it a critical issue? Is it a critical problem? Well, I believe it's not, because when we combine planning with acting, we can actually um, solve for this problem of planning long term. Meaning that, um, in simple terms, go do your startup, go, I don't know, build your uh, crafting item you were always wanted to build, and actually see which issues you will get. Actually, uh, try to do an action, see the result of this action and the effect of it, work with this effect, perceive it, and then replan again to get to your goal. Action is the most efficient environmental computation, and we don't need LLMs to have a capability to plan too far away. Planning too far away increases informational entropy. We don't need that. We can just plan, we can basically, we basically need the first action to be planned well. Other subsequent action in the process might not be planned well. We will still replan everything after we did this most efficient environmental computation in time and space. Sorry for, for such a complicated term here. <laughs> but basically, what I'm saying here, action speaks louder than planning, action speaks louder than prediction. If we have an LLM, if we open, up, open it up and give it an ability to act and perceive the result, perceive the effect of action, we don't need um, planning too far in advance, too far in the future. We only need the first steps to, um, to be planned well, to be executed well. Now, with all of these components, we pretty much can build a functional AI agent um, that can actually achieve on quite a lot of tasks and will be quite AGI-like. So it will be quite close to artificial general intelligence. The problem, it won't be practical at all. If you want to put it outside or work for some particular goal or work for some particular task, it will be extremely expensive, very inefficient. And this is now my speculation in terms of what's coming next for this industry. I feel like this industry now is working a lot on optimizing and optimization of different um, approaches and techniques. And that's actually, let me, let me show you the move I, I learned recently. So I'm not like thinking about the next motion. I, I learned it through imitation learning after watching some YouTube video. And I'm like, I'm not having any inefficient reasoning process in my brain. I don't think about it. I just perform the move. I have a muscle memory already. For now, AI agents, they think about the next action. They think how to put the hand, where to put its butt, and so on. So they actually do some quite inefficient computation. There is no muscle memory technique there that optimizes, that kind of caches the process. And for this, I believe, 
action and behavior based models can be that component of a brain that helps with this muscle memory. I also believe that imitation learning, motion diffusion planning um, is going to be there for AI agents as well. Um, there is something going on in the industry around it, but it's not quite there yet in terms of implementing these approaches as a part of autonomous AI agents. But I think that's a part of the future. Another part of the future is um, video processing and efficient video processing. Right now, LLMs are not processing video information well. They are not print rated on the videos in any way. Um, at MIT, uh, at C-Cell, the liquid neural nets have been developed with sparse wiring. Um, that's basically a technique for autonomous vehicles to better navigate with the information that they receive from, from their computer vision sensors. Um, as well as for, say, drones, for cars, for autonomous, for everything that exists in a real environment and that can perceive the video information. It, it is extremely efficient model, very small one, that can still provide this navigation capabilities. I feel like this can be, can be um, aligned with something similar to instincts that human has. And for the last part that I want to touch, um, when we put AI agent in the environment, when we optimize it, when it's efficient, maybe not today, maybe sometime in the future, um, we potentially can have this agent socialize and work together. And there is already, there are a couple of um, projects that are exploring this. Like say my favorite one is ChatDev. It's basically a company made of AI agents that do software 24-7. Each AI agent is specialized. One does coding, another one does designing, the third one does testing, the fourth one does development. And you bring them a task, they all try to solve this task together as a, as a collective intelligence. And another thing for you to Google or chat GPT after this lecture is Microsoft's AutoGen framework, where they explore specific interfaces and interactions between agents, how to make this happen and how to implement it. At last, again, when I come back to the subject about AGI and artificial general intelligence and ask you a question, are we there yet? I personally believe we, are, we have all the components that we need. The problem now is we need to glue them all together. Another problem now is that the gluing process is not going to happen like this year, next year. It's going to take us probably a decade. Well, we can, we can specifically predict how much or forecast how much, but I'm pretty much sure that from the theoretical perspective, with LLMs, we have solved one of the um, key critical problem, which is reasoning. We didn't have this capability before. Now we have this capability and bringing these interfaces, bringing these tools, putting this reasoning um, model in time and environment is just a matter of engineering and combining these components in the right way. Until we get there, until we get to this AGI part, until we get to this point, we still need to consider how can we make these AI agents practical. And this is critical right now. We cannot trust at max the AI agent that we built, so we need to understand how we put the human in the loop. The huge topic of user experience and user interface for AI agent right now is in Silicon Valley. Also, many companies are talking about that. We have hackathons about that, where we explore how to specifically put human in the loop to approve what AI agents want to do. And I feel like till we get to, till we gain all the trust we need, um, this is going to be probably one of the key developments um, in the industry. And we probably never would, would be at the point when we have all the trust. Always humans will be accountable for something. We will just reduce some stuff or delegate some stuff that we are comfortable delegating ac accountability for. But most of the time, the, the decision will still be driven by humans. So we need to learn now how to effectively integrate human with an agent so that they can collaborate well. So today, after today, or maybe after this course um, overall, check out this concept. I think the slides will be uh, published. Um, chat GPT about them, Google them. Again, don't worry about the terminology. It might be a bit effed up. Um, it might be a bit confusing. 
But yeah, that's how the industry is structured today, unfortunately. Um, all these techniques and all of these approaches are extremely powerful and, and bring the autonomous AGI-like agents to life even today. And I'm always happy to discuss this topic with you. That's my LinkedIn um, on the QR code. That's my twi Twitter, although I don't use it that much. Um, welcome to reach out to me and chat about autonomous AI agents overall. Thank you very much. Okay. Guys, you spent like two hours listening about so many concepts and switching back and forth between, between different topics. I guess like... Like an autonomous agent. Huh? Like an autonomous agent. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, questions. questions. Yeah. Yep. Um, so the first part is like, what are these current like models, like the way you're thinking about it? kind of like inspired by like human intelligence, right? Like when you said like there are different kinds of parts of our brain and like the models like would, would also like work this way. But do you believe that like this is like ultimate goal or there's like another way of arranging that's much better than like humans and we shouldn't use like humans like inspiration, you know? Extremely, yeah, extremely great question, I feel like, because also I'm, I don't have an answer to that. I feel like, um, from what I see, well, there are some subject like what Ricard discussed today, right? We still can use foundational models with the modalities that are unusual, that were unthinkable of to be used before. Where humans are, I mean, we don't see in biology, in, in, an, in our environment out, uh, around us, something that also uses this data, this information in the way um, that, say, foundational models are being built right now, right? Like foundational models for behavior and that are being used for retail, for instance. So it's kind of like an intuitive. So still, there is something that evolution hasn't been able to achieve. But I feel like evolution was still an extremely powerful process, right? And it, it has built extremely efficient machine in our brain and in our head. So I still feel like we will draw, and there will be a lot, of, a lot to learn about it, and we will draw a lot of lessons. Some historical artifacts, right, will be probably eliminated since we are constructing it artificially, right? But I'm pretty sure that's like vast amount of information uh, provided for, by nature to us that we haven't explored fully yet. And I feel like we, um, we pretty much will lean towards how the human brain is being developed and, and, and how we interact and act. So yeah. Make sense? Yeah. yeah thank you. Okay. Awesome. Um, thank you very much, everyone. All right, guys. Thank you.